presentations by Professor Si Tsui from the Institute of Rural Reconstruction in China at the Southwest University in Chongqing. And uh, also on the same platform with Professor Qin Chin Lao from the Global University for Sustainability and the Department of Cultural Studies in Lingnan University in Hong Kong, China. Uh, the two will uh, make presentations, I understand, just about uh, 45 minutes. So uh, uh, please be mindful of the time so that we have some ample time for discussion thereafter. And the discussion for today's paper will be Professor Pravin Jha from uh, our uh, network in the Center for Informal Sector and Labor Studies in uh, Jawal Nehru University. Perhaps without much ado, may I invite uh, uh, Professor Sito Jade uh, Margaret to uh, give us uh, her presentation. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much. And I uh, prepare a PowerPoint and so I will uh, share the screen. Yeah, can you see it? Yes. Yeah, and I will start now. Um, the title is China New Development Challenges. And I will focus the two points. Uh, one is about the financial, financialization and uh, also uh, how China deal with this problem. And uh, the um, one of the uh, opportunities is to um, practice the policy of rural uh, revitalization. This is a, a recent government, uh, a government recent policy, but I also uh, want to st uh, stress the point that uh, uh, from uh, people and also, also have to work with government to um, promote this uh, policy. So um, next I will show you the, uh, and uh, as you know that now uh, the U.S. Uh, has, um, Michael Hudson mentioned, uh, now the U.S. politician, particularly Trump uh, administration, are raging a uh, new cold war against uh, Russia, China, Iran, and oil exporting, exporting uh, countries that the United States is seeking to isolate if cannot control their government, central bank, and foreign policy, foreign uh, diplomacy. So uh, now the China was, uh, uh, have having a new cold war with uh, U United States. And before that, we also have the uh, trade war. And also uh, we uh, are un the, our, uh, the high tech company like uh, uh, Zhongxin and Huawei also are under attack. And um, as you know that um, in this um, new cold war and uh, our focus is not about the ideological uh, conflicts or argument, whether this is an uh, authoritarian government or a new liberal or a, a, a um, free uh, country or, or democratic country. The problem is the how we um, deal with the problem of the financial uh, monopolies. Has uh, Armin uh, remind us in uh, two years ago, and we did an interview uh, with uh, Sami Amin and. Uh, that interview we upload to uh, Global U. If you're interested, you can uh, have a look. And uh, in this interview, I mean, um, focus on how he uh, criticized the financial globalization. And he mentioned that uh, China should not uh, join in or move in. But uh, in our analysis, we think that uh, China has already in the global uh, economy, but uh, we still have the so-called the uh, capital control or are not fully open the market to financial capital yet, but we still have this problem of financialization. And uh, he mentioned that uh, in the uh, whole world, the uh, well, is actually controlled by the financial monopolies and particularly the bank and also the uh, financial uh, sector, like uh, particularly the Wall Street uh, the groups. And uh, he particularly mentions the, uh, the, uh, the 20 giant banks. They all based in United States and this kind of the triad, he mentioned the United States, Europe and Japan control more than 98% of the giant volume or transaction operate on that market. That means how can we uh, de-link, uh, uh, echo, uh, I mean, uh, uh, worked, how we de-link from the uh, financial globalization is the um, main task of our um, 
of our country and also our people because it that means that how can we channel our so-called the capital or suppressed capital channel a channel to the uh, uh, agriculture and also to protect our uh, basic livelihood and as you know that the uh, US dollar still dom dom uh, dominates the global reserves. Even um, people mentioned that the Chinese renminbi actually is rising and then getting uh, uh, getting more importance. But in terms of the global uh, reserves, uh, the um, United States uh, US dollar is still dominating the, uh, the market of global reserves. And uh, one of the um, points I want to address that because of the uh, outbreak of COVID-19, the US stock market uh, forced the um, Federal Reserve to um, practice this the QE4 uh, quantitative evasion uh, with now the um, volume is so uh, big, it's about the U US dollar uh, 700 billion on that on uh, March in 2020, that means it's a triple or um, triple times, a triple times of the, uh, when uh, uh, what happened in 2008 uh, global financial crisis in 2008. So now actually we face that how uh, the US dollar um, 700 billion, how they, they will uh, transfer the inflation to the uh, de particularly developing countries because that kind of uh, capital is a parasite and also the speculative. So how they uh, use of this money, particularly they will, uh, is kind of a flooding. That means uh, the, um, the China actually is uh, facing that um, a threat. I would say that it's uh, not only physical so-called flooding, but it's the financial flooding from the uh, United States. And um, and as you uh, and we uh, also we found that the uh, many uh, the in uh, transnational uh, financial uh, institution they always uh, try to um, enter the um, Chinese um, uh, financial market. For, for example, like uh, J, uh, JP Morgan Chase, they already uh, has to um, increase their uh, share, share their shares. Um, because uh, on uh, 1st of April, China, China, China has already uh, uh, changed the policy. It announced the, um, uh, the maximum, the, the, uh, maximum uh, percentage of foreign shareholding from uh, 49 to 51 and now 100%. So this is a uh, very um, serious because uh, before that uh, China is, is not uh, completely open to its uh, financial market, even has the control the uh, shareholding of foreign uh, companies. But uh, after uh, 1st of April, it uh, opened, it let the uh, foreign financial company has the 100% um, the control of the financial uh, companies. I think that is uh, uh, very significant, but uh, let's wait and see whether, some, whether uh, China will uh, completely open its financial market. You know that uh, China's government still have the control of the foreign exchange rate. And also uh, to a certain extent, sometimes it's a uh, practice uh, capital control, sometimes capital uh, let it flow. So, uh, you, 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 we, so we still uh, wait and see how uh, China uh, government deal with this uh, financialization or deal with the um, financial capital, we still wait and see. But now um, this is a really a, a danger for us. And, um, and you also find that even uh, the outbreak of uh, COVID-19, uh, China has the um, problem of the um, uh, problem of the export um, Ex, ex, export because it uh, goes uh, went down and also the uh, very, uh, there's a, a decreasing uh, FDI but we found that uh, for the uh, last uh, two or three months is uh, gradually increased again so we found that uh, the uh, foreign uh, companies are still uh, can earn uh, make profits in uh, Chinese market so this is that means uh, China is still in the um, uh, global economy, and then uh, even um, uh, they uh, sometimes uh, they also uh, emphasize we have to recover. 
the uh, economy. But uh, I think um, we still have the um, this kind of uh, risk. And also, uh, when uh, in Chinese context, sometimes when we mention crisis, at the same time, we also means a kind of uh, a possibility or alternatives, because uh, now we are facing the new Cold War, and then we have the uh, US sanction. That means we try to uh, shift uh, because this kind of delinking is not uh, China take initiative to do this kind of delinking. It's because the uh, uh, U.S. tried to um, uh, point China has the primary uh, enemy. In this, at that moment, we try to uh, shift this um, crisis into opportunities or into uh, possibility to um, uh, to search another or alternative path. And, and, and then you, you also find that we have quite a lot of the uh, foreign um, uh, reserved currency. And, uh, but, uh, but when, uh, if you remember in 2015 and uh, 15 and 16, we have the uh, stock market crash. At that time, we uh, almost lose uh, one third of our um, foreign uh, reserve currency. And uh, that means uh, we, we already in uh, this kind of uh, globalized economy, and we also find that uh, it is easily that let the uh, capital flow in and flow out. So uh, we also have this uh, problem of capital um, um, uh, flow out. But um, has I um, and also we also have the uh, because we are the the. Um, the biggest um, foreign holders of U.S. debt. That means that we actually we already um, within the same uh, system. It's quite different from the uh, last uh, century because uh, in the old uh, Cold War, that means uh, um, one one country and uh, one world and two system. But now actually it's one world two uh, one world one system because we still in the uh, global economy uh, system that is uh, led by U.S. But because of the uh, uh, so-called new Cold War, and then we try to uh, get a, to, to get away this kind of uh, financial globalization. Um, and uh, thanks to the uh, uh, land revolution in 1949, that means uh, we still have the, um, I would say that we still have the condition to uh, deal with this uh, uh, new Cold War or US sanction. Because of the uh, land revolution, we have the, uh, that the majority has their, has, uh, has a land uh, redistribution and also has their own uh, food and also uh, shelter. That means uh, we have the, uh, certain uh, advantages to uh, deal with the external crisis. And uh, according to uh, official uh, figure, now the uh, uh, China has um, the total assets has about a uh, looming be 1,300 uh, trillion. That means about a US dollar, 182 trillion. And uh, it including the financial and non-financial assets, but uh, this not include the uh, land uh, resources because land uh, actually is not a sale on, uh, it's not announced sale on the market. That means uh, it's belong to the uh, um, village committee and in urban area is belong to the state. That means the um, land belong to state and also belong to village committee. And, uh, and uh, apart from the land resources and uh, foreign uh, capital is still uh, uh, want to uh, privatize uh, the, um, the uh, China banks because uh, in the world, the one, two, three, four, the top four bank actually belongs to uh, Chinese government. Uh, all four uh, Chinese bank is a state control. We, when we mean state control, that means the uh, party control because uh, in uh, the bank, uh, the, the state, uh, the, part, the party actually is the, um, the so-called the CEO. That means the, he is the um, control of the, um, uh, the bank. So when we say that state control, most probably is, uh, means uh, party control. And um, uh, now uh, the Chinese government has the new uh, policy is uh, named, uh, the name is the internal uh, circulation. What does it mean? It refers to uh, dual circulation because it, uh, on the one hand, it, uh, government still want to keep the so-called international circulation. That means the export oriented economy. But at the same time, they find that because of the COVID-19, because of US sanction, they have to change uh, to look into 
the uh, internal economy. That means the uh, rural economy and also domestic demand. That is very uh, uh, a great shift. I mean, uh, particularly at that moment. Uh, and we, but uh, before uh, this uh, new policy, actually in 2017, uh, the president Xi Jinping already promoted the policy. It's called the uh, rural revitalization. The uh, the main in uh, the the part uh, the main part of that policy is to renew the uh, the right of land use to a uh, small peasant for thirty more years. That means the uh, the Chinese um, government still to keep promise or to still keep the legacy of land revolution because that means it's uh, guarantee the basic livelihood for the uh, small peasantry. And um, and uh, I. I uh, when we talk about internal circulation uh, policy, uh, on the one hand is uh, emphasize the rural revitalization. On the other hand, it's also emphasize how to uh, advance over the uh, industry. Because uh, in, uh, in 2008, uh, when um, China, Chinese government had the problem of financial crisis, it promoted the, uh, the infrastructure to channel the capital into infrastructure. But nowadays, they still want to channel to infrastructure, but that kind of infrastructure uh, particularly works for the internet or uh, um, information technology. So it includes, for example, 5G, internet, industrial internet, uh, cloud uh, computing, blockchain, data centers, and smart computing centers, and uh, smart uh, transportation. Anyway, that is another kind of the um, um, uh, information technology advance. And, uh, and, and uh, I also want to uh, present this uh, picture. Uh, China even is, is, called, is a kind of a very big, uh, country, but actually, is um, there are very uh, there are a lot of or uh, millions of uh, small peasants, according to the uh, official figures. The uh, small peasant accounts for ninety eight percent of the agency of agriculture uh, activities, and uh, we still have two hundred and thirty million peasant households, and uh, the the household. But actually, we don't. Uh, we only have a. Uh, a seven point eight mu of uh, equable land. Um, uh, mu that means uh, one hectare is equal to uh, fifteen mu. That means uh, uh, each household only less than one mu of equable land. So we still have a lot of uh, or millions of um, peasants living in, in China, and uh, whenever the uh, peasant has the opportunity to go to the city or uh, to become a citizen, but uh, many peasants actually they are not willing to give up their uh, farmland and uh, residential land because uh, they said that we have land at home village. No matter we go to the city or return to home, we still have our base. The base that means a uh, basic livelihood. For example, uh, during the COVID nineteen, many uh, um, because at that time is our um, uh, spring festival, many uh, migrant workers, about uh, uh, two thousand uh, million, they um, went uh, they went to the uh, uh, home village uh, to celebrate spring festival. At that time, because of COVID nineteen, they stay it and at their home village, they have they can have access to food. They have staple food. They don't need to buy in the market. And also, so uh, why uh, China can um, contain the COVID-19? Uh, the one uh, very important reason is that we have the land revolution. We guarantee the majority stay in the village, have their food, have their shelter, and then they are not completely depend on market. And also they have more space in the countryside. It's quite different from the uh, slum area in the uh, cities, uh, like uh, in um, uh, Brazil or India. And so as I think uh, when we talk about the uh, uh, poll uh, COVID-19, or even we actually we're not yet overcome COVID-19, we have to propose the uh, a grand reform or land reform again in the 21st century, but in different way. And um, so uh, this picture shows you that uh, in terms of uh, food sufficiency, uh, sufficiency, we still have uh, control on the production of grain in terms of rice, wheat, and corn. But uh, quite, uh, but uh, unfortunately, in terms of soya bean, we import a lot from uh, United States and also Brazil. Actually, it's um, it's a really very very sad. And uh, I think we we have to uh, um, uh, tackle this problem together. 
And uh, and also uh, not only the land resources, and uh, we also have the uh, rural collective property. And because uh, uh, according to the uh, official uh, figure, uh, at end at the end of two thousand nineteen, uh, we still have a uh, five thousand six hundred and ninety five township. Uh, six hundred and two thousand villages. When we mean, uh, when we say village, that means village communities is a collectivity, and also we have uh, over uh, two million uh, production groups, and this is also is a kind of collective unity, and um, and the uh, collective uh, rural collectives has very enormous assets in terms of uh, land. There is about 6.5 uh, uh, billion mu, and the assets, uh, the book of value of assets is about the uh, 6.5 trillion renminbi, around uh, 1 trillion US dollar. And uh, I want to emphasize that uh, most of the assets belong to the village level. I, it means that it's still under the uh, com uh, community control. And that means a uh, village. That also means a uh, panchaya in uh, India. So we, how can we? Uh, this is kind of a very, uh, um, I mean, um, uh, Asians um, uh, tradition. How can we protect the uh, village? How can we protect panchaya? And not only land resources, but also uh, the um, the I mean the organization or uh, the um, the value. How that lets the uh, young children or a young person uh, take this as a advantages to deal with the external uh, crisis, for example, unemployment in the city. And um, uh, our research team, um, particularly under uh, Professor Wen, we have um, um, analyzed the, um, the, the 10 crises in uh, modern China. And then we, uh, our conclusion, our conclusion that uh, whenever we have crisis, we have to ask, I mean, the ask the um, rural society to deal with this. And uh, that means uh, whenever we can um, protect our village and our village communities, and then that means we can have advantages. We have condition to uh, deal with the crisis. For example, unemployment. During the Cultural Revolution, we actually sent uh, 40 million unemployed educated uh, uh, urban youth uh, to this countryside. So uh, this is our experience. And uh, during the 1980s, we still have experience to uh, promote or emphasize the importance of township village enterprise. At that time, rural uh, economy is very, uh, was very uh, um, very um, powerful compared with the uh, coastal area urban uh, enterprise. And um, uh, since 2006, uh, we have the uh, new socialist countryside um, policy. And at that time, uh, uh, the government actually has uh, invested a lot on the San Long. That means the uh, agriculture and also uh, person and also uh, the rural society. That means they channel a lot of the uh, money to the uh, countryside. Uh, it's about the 1,014,400 uh, 1, uh, billion uh, renminbi. So uh, we found that uh, for the uh, last, trend, uh, last uh, at least 10 years, Chinese government actually invest quite a lot in uh, the rural sectors uh, because uh, can you also remember that during the uh, uh, 1998, 2008, we still have this uh, Asian financial crisis and also uh, a global financial crisis. At that time, Chinese government can't uh, uh, continue the export-oriented economy. So that means they have to channel their, um, I mean, the productions and also the uh, capital towards the um, countryside, towards the rural society. That means uh, we have that uh, opportunities uh, to change the um, export oriented economy. That means uh, what's happened now, we also have the uh, problem of the so-called global, uh, the, the rupture or uh, the breakdown of global surprise. But uh, to us, I think it's also good opportunity. Yes. I just want to check on your time because uh, yeah. So that yeah. is over now. Yeah. I almost uh, finished, yeah. Okay. And yeah. yes, yeah. 
And so that means um, now uh, we uh, even we now have the so-called U.S. sanctions. Uh, we have to face the uh, problem of the exports. Uh, but I think uh, it's also a good opportunity for us to promote more pro-rural policy, like uh, rural revitalization, how to uh, uh, encourage or to work with government to deal with this kind of surplus uh, capital, surplus um, the um, uh, or even the um, the labor. So uh, that points that means uh, how can we uh, let the urban people and rural people, particularly the uh, middle class, because now they have the uh, uh, more uh, surplus capital, how they let them cooperate with the rural uh, collectives. And that means uh, from uh, below, that means from people, we also have to uh, grasp this uh, opportunity to work with this kind of uh, uh, pro-rural policy. That means uh, we can have uh, uh, opportunities to um, find an alternative path. Finish. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Prof. Uh, maybe without much ado, shall we ask ask a kin to just say, "Come on board and take us to the next level, please." So. Uh, Good day and good evening, uh, everybody. Uh, I'm very glad to be here to be uh, well, uh, having a dialogue with you. So I will try to be brief because uh, we, uh, we would like to have more time uh, for discussions. Um, well, the, the overall uh, title uh, of the, this series of dialogues is on um, specters of crisis and rays of hope. Um, I think um, the crisis that haunt us, uh, they include the pandemic, uh, the harsh economic realities for people's livelihood in the midst of casino capitalism, and of course, there's the climate catastrophe, which is uh, what we call the triple trap in the seventh sub sub forum on sustainability. But uh, we are confronted uh, here, I think, not just with specters, but actually with the zombies. They are there, they are real, and they are very uh, solid. And uh, I think uh, we are adding to this, uh, we also have the specter of war, uh, because now there are increasing tensions in the Asia Pacific region. Although uh, we know that war has ravaged um, in many regions in the Middle East and in different parts of the world. And um, in any time of catastrophe, uh, no matter how desperate the situation may seem, people must hang on with hope. And it is hope that sustains the will for survival. With people sharing the same hope, there is better coordinated action and strength. So as one writer uh, in China, Lu Xun says, if hope is illusory, so is despair. So we have, and so I think um, that is also why I think the organizers have named this uh, series of dialogues, uh, Race of Hope. That is, we should still con uh, try as much as possible to see where hope lies and how that can help uh, foster action. Um, today, uh, uh, it is most apt that uh, in our dialogue, uh, we draw on Samia Min's uh, legacy. Uh, on, this very on this very day, two years ago, he left us, and he left us a rich legacy to continue with the struggles for humanity. And I hope to draw on his key concept of delinking in our discussions. Well, uh, I must first say that um, what uh, uh, Professor Sid and I are presenting, it is, is um, the, uh, a collective effort by the global university team of about uh, 15 persons. And uh, we, uh, many of us are working on voluntary or semi-voluntary basis. And uh, so after the seventh, um, uh, South South Forum on Sustainability, we are going uh, to continue with the South South Dialogue on Sustainability. So uh, we hope that these times of um, dialogue and conversations can continue. Well, uh, Professor Sid already uh, gave some key figures for us to refer to in the discussions. I would like to first point out that the complexities in referring to China as one entity is a problem. Uh, because um, uh, 
there are the complex, uh, it is, well, it is very easy for us to refer to China as if uh, we know what that means. But actually, uh, this is a very complicated. And I think uh, we have to, to know that uh, China is so vast uh, with diverse local specificities. And then there are the complex intertwining relationships between global forces, the state, local institutions, and the local people. And these in the, uh, complex relationships need to be understood so that there could be meaningful participation by the people to deal with the problems in their specificities. So the rural reconstru reconstruction movement that Professor Sid and our team have been involved in for the last 20 years in China. We have worked at the local levels and these experiences require our understanding, our interpretation and intervention to try to uh, uh, enable the dynamics and potentials uh, to be played out. And so why local communities? Because that is where our efforts should go into. So now on China, um, uh, very quickly on the macro scene, of course, everybody now knows that about the, um, the, the, the tensions between China and the uh, USA. And I think uh, my, my, my personal opinion is that um, with this uh, US strategy uh, of the uh, Cold War, new Cold War escalating and heating up, I don't think it's going to end with whoever gets the presidency in November. I think in this era of competition in financial globalization, uh, while you have a Federal Reserve in the USA representing the interest of the private bankers in China, as Professor Sid just said, mentioned, you have the state-owned banks. And I think this is where the US uh, wants to break uh, this uh, hold. Uh, within uh, China, our own team have, uh, has been proposing capital control instead of free capital flow. And uh, you just heard from Professor Sid that about the landmark, which is uh, the 1st of April this year, when according to the WTO uh, regulations, which China is complying with, um, uh, China is opening up more to the uh, uh, fully owned uh, foreign uh, enterprises in securities, in finance sectors. So while we have a lot of uh, apprehensions about these, um, we are not still sure about the outcomes and the effects. Uh, we still need to watch and monitor the inflow and the outflow of capital to see how the finance game is playing and how China may be entrapped in this um, financialization. So the Cold War is heating up, and um, to quote uh, Professor Wen, uh, this is not just a, this is not the rivalry of uh, two systems like what we had uh, before the collapse of the Soviet Union. As somehow we are all under one system of globalization and playing by the laws of capital and trade, competing on technology, communication, space war, financial tools, etc. And the current uh, China-US standoff is not only on trade, uh, finance, and communication, although these are already very heated areas. There is the specter of outright war. Uh, recently, with all the uh, warplanes and warships from both sides testing the waters. Uh, I would like to draw your attention to the RAND report, uh, which is... Um, I, I think, uh, though, of course, they claim to be neutral and uh, nonpartisan, they represent the rightist um, wings of the uh, Republicans. Uh, the, um, and um, the, there is this uh, RAND report in 2016, which says that um, uh, they said, uh, well, we should think the unthinkable. So what is the unthinkable? That is the title. The title of that report in 2016 is War with China, Thinking Through the Unthinkable. So what is the unthinkable? They were saying that although a war could harm both economies in the US and in China, but then the damage to China would be much worse. So there, was a lot, there are a lot of calculations and they estimate that if there is one year's severe war, intense war between China and the US, 
then the damage for U.S. economy would be 5 to 10 percent, whereas the damage for Chinese economy would be 25 to 35 percent. So the, the conclusion that, is, that comes out, actually, we, we can all tell that it is worth it. It is worth it for the U.S. to fight such a war, to inflict damage on what they see as the biggest enemy now, which is China. And in the recent uh, July 2020 report, um, then there is the they envisage China's economy to be ascending or stagnant uh, uh, until 2050. And then you, if you look at the recommendations, they tell you what the U.S. military should do, what sort of strategy they should take and all this. So all these reports are for free downloads. So I would recommend that uh, you go and look at the RAND reports and then see, uh, try to look into the mindset and the strategies uh, of the um, of the writers uh, in this uh, most dangerous country on earth. So um, I will not go into these details, but um, I think uh, the the question faced for uh, that China is now facing is not what uh, Samir uh, talks about as delinking. It is in a way some kind of delinking, but then it is forced uh, delinking by the U.S., which is not something preferred uh, by the Chinese leadership, uh, as far as we can see. So uh, Sami's uh, two main concerns and strategies uh, for, uh, about uh, delinking for China is on financialization. He says uh, China shouldn't go into financial globalization. And he's also insisting that there should be the uh, firm hold on the peasants' uh, revolutionary gains, which is uh, not only the land, but also the small peasant um, production. And, and so, uh, well, uh, uh, Professor Sid already explained these two parts, and so I'm not going to go into the details, but I would want to highlight that um, Sami's uh, strategy of delinking has the overall goal of defending national sovereignty and avoiding subordination to the agenda of the oligarchic triad, the US, Europe, and Japan, in the global division of labor. And what does that mean? That means that uh, the needs and the welfare of the majority of the population should be the priority. So the implications for both domestic and foreign policy for a conscious strategy of delinking should be there, which is not something that is forced. But of course, we see now that China is coming to has to come to terms with the with an enforced delinking in certain ways, especially in finance and in its um, uh, investments, etc. So how the uh, current um, uh, 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 con uh, 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 conjuncture could be leading to a more proactive strategy for delinking in the benefit, for the benefit of the majority of the population in China, but since China cannot defend its own interests within its national borders, there has to be a proactive uh, foreign policy, which would have to be something like the Bandung uh, 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 Alliance from the 1950s that Sami talks so much about. So uh, now we see that um, faced uh, the, the question for everybody is not only for China, it's for other developing countries and the situation is very serious because in the ep epidemic, people do not talk so much now about luxuries or travel or, 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 or anything uh, else, but lives and livelihood. These have become the priority. And so when we talk about lives and livelihood, we talk about health, food, water, and land. And I think that is where what we have been insisting on, the question about uh, peasantry, the question about food production, food sovereignty, and the access of peasants to land, to uh, the, 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 the means of production uh, for agriculture, and the reliance of the global population on small peasant production has become so paramount. 
So uh, we, we, we are now uh, seeing in the, in the very short term is the question of the pandemic and all question of unemployment, question of starvation and famine. But then in the just the medium term of 10 or 20 years, we, have, we are seeing the question of climate change. And the climate change with all the ex um, weather extremities would be the, uh, one of the most uh, 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 disastrous um, consequences the human, human, uh, hum, uh, the human species have to face. So I think uh, we need to um, uh, that uh, uh, have a, 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 a now uh, when when we always talk about the crisis and opportunity. I think the opportunity does not usually follow automatically uh, uh, to the crisis. So there need to be. Uh, a different approach, a different mindset. And so I think for China now is talking about, um, well, internal circulation uh, of the resources, of supplies, of infrastructure uh, investments faced with uh, the US as uh, possible sanctions and cut off. But then I think um, in, when we talk about the internal circulation, I think we also have to note that if it is an internal circulation driven still by the logic of capital, which is for profit, which is at the expense of the vulnerable, of the um, uh, marginalized, then we, this is not something which would be um, desirable. So that is also where I think uh, uh, it is important for us um, to be stressing that, uh, the, that the priority should be the needs and the welfare of the majority of the population. So just now, Professor Sid uh, mentioned uh, that the, the changes in the policies of the Chinese government uh, in, in, in uh, putting in lots of money, lots of funds for rural development. And we should note that that happened uh, as that, that started around 1999 after it well that was in the aftermath of the 1997 uh, financial crisis in asia and be because of that crisis then there was the need for china to turn inward and also to start developing the western parts the less developed parts and of course uh, this policy in a way should be welcome because um, that means diverting resources for the needy so I think China can be proud to say that um, it has met with the um, uh, goals of the, um, the millennium goals of reducing uh, extreme poverty by half, but already in 2010 or so. And, um, and, and uh, the government says that uh, this year, China is going to eliminate uh, all extreme poverty. And in some ways, uh, from the figures, from the situations, then we see that this is becoming a reality. So in a way, uh, the, some of the government policies have benefited the very poor, but then uh, there need to be a, 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 a radical change or um, a, a big change in the, in the, in the kind of um, mentality for modernization, going after uh, the US and the West as the models and, uh, and then competing at, on the terms uh, which are uh, well set by others. So on the one that to conclude, um, I think, um, well, it is not only uh, a question about state policies, it is also a question about uh, how the general public would be looking at what is a good life, uh, what is a uh, a preferred way of living, what is uh, a way where we can have uh, socioeconomic justice as well as ecological justice. And um, well, to, uh, for uh, Sami, uh, when he was um, in the hospital uh, uh, two years ago, well, four days before his death, uh, Remy Herrera and I went to the hospital to, to see him 
And he, at that time, he was talking about two things. Uh, he talked about uh, China-Zimbabwe relationship because at that time, the, well, the China, China, Chinese leaders were visiting Zimbabwe. And so Sami was hoping for a strengthening of the strategic cooperative partnership between China and Zimbabwe, but on terms which would be not on the, the uh, on the follow not following the logic of capital or but then following the logic of uh, solidarity. So the U.S. in the Rand report they say we do not believe in what China says about the win-win situation, but I think we have to talk about this win-win situation when we talk about the solidarity between China and other developing countries, and. Um, and I think uh, we also need to think not only in, in uh, nation state terms, not only in terms that uh, I am Chinese and you are Zimbabwean or you are Filipino, but then I think uh, we need to have this alliance of the working peoples based on our uh, 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 identification as peasants, as food producers, as the uh, women, as the indigenous, as the most oppressed. And I think there's also Sami's uh, dream of having a broad alliance of um, people's movements, but with the people at the center, not with the NGOs or the intellectuals, especially intellectuals who can speak English and, and Spanish, etc., but with the, the social movements as the main basis and um, uh, dynamic for these movements. So to end, um, well, we, we talk about poverty alleviation and indeed, um, well, China has been quite exemplary in these uh, efforts for poverty alleviation. But I think when we talk about poverty there's also it's not just uh, material poverty there's also spiritual poverty there's the poverty of spiritual and material being uh, poverty of imagination and of audacity so we there's the need for a change in our culture culture, culture and mindset and uh, and i think that is where we still owe our a lot to samia min who has called on us to have Audacity and more audacity. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Kin, uh, for that uh, uh, presentation. And uh, uh, without uh, wasting much time, uh, I note we have got one or two other people who have joined us. And uh, at an opportune time, we'd like them to invite them to also share their thoughts about the subject matter on hand. Mm -hmm. uh, Praveen, can I ask you to do your comment, please? Uh, just to make sure that at least we observe our time. Uh, if you also keep watching me, I might uh, give this signal if, or just give you the minutes, yeah? Cool, thank you. Sure. Go ahead, sure. please. Okay, okay, so uh, let me first of all express my gratitude to both uh, Professor uh, Setsui and Professor Kinchi for their absolutely masterful presentations. Now, they have picked up a theme uh, which has a huge canvas. There are lots of issues there, but some of the critical things that they brought into the discussion today for our consideration are extremely worthwhile. And I'll come to some of those in a minute. But before that, let me also, on behalf of uh, all of us, Agrarian South Network, the Institute, SAMU, African uh, Institute for Agrarian Studies, and others who are part of uh, this initiative for dialogue, uh, pay our uh, deep, deep gratitude to late Professor Samir Amin for his um, fantastic contributions over a very long period of time. In fact, uh, you know, I think it would be uh, fair to say that the intellectual history of uh, the post Second World War era would be incomplete if we do not have an adequate engagement with what Samir stood for, not only on, let's say, Africa or uh, some particular themes like uh, African socialism but on a whole range of issues, some of which were picked up in particular, this whole idea of uh, delinking and its meaning, something which had come up in our 
uh, dialogue last time as well uh, when Professor Shivji uh, and his colleagues uh, released that uh, fantastic uh, uh, biography of uh, Naidere and uh, there was a discussion on some of these issues. Uh, we in our own small way had uh, tried to pay our tribute uh, through the journal as well. Uh, which was the uh, uh, first issue of volume one, Agrarian South Journal of Political Economy. And uh, it is uh, freely accessible. So anyone, you know, for some more time, it should be freely accessible. And I would urge everyone who's participating in this conversation today to have a look at that. Uh, Professor Shivji is somewhere there. His contribution uh, was a very important one in that particular journal. And there are some others who uh, were very much part of it. So with that, with remembering uh, late uh, Professor Samir Amin, his fantastic contributions to our understanding, intellectual and about strategies, etc. Let me come to the two great uh, comrades and their great presentations today, uh, Sitsui and uh, Kinchi. Now, as I said that uh, it was a masterful presentation in terms of focusing on a whole range of issues. Uh, what is the current situation? What are the major development challenges? Uh, the new concerns, the way they are emerging, uh, what could be the way forward? So on a whole lot of these uh, issues, I think uh, uh, we had excellent uh, observations and remarks. Uh, yes, indeed, we are in an era of new Cold War. There's just no two ways about it. Uh, it's been building for a while and now it has reached uh, a kind of a very noisy, very, very aggressive uh, context where you know, the triad, as, as, as uh, Samir used to say, is uh, hell-bent on trying to uh, ensure that other kinds of models, other kinds of possibilities in which China has played a major role, not only for itself, but for the larger context as well know how that must be contained if not assaulted and so on so that is something which um, is uh, a very very uh, real threat at the current juncture we can only hope that uh, the way situation builds up it gets contained etc but yes the threat is indeed real in terms of uh, the specific issues regarding china's development challenges i mean i think um, sitsui is bang on target that uh, this recent move precisely because of uh, uh, a kind of, uh, you know, uh, semi-enforced linking. And that's what, that, that's how I would like to put it because at some point, you know, China opted for the membership of WTO. Uh, there were uh, this consideration that uh, great gains can be made and were indeed made in terms of the overall economic transformation of that country. You know, if you look at only 1990 or so, and, uh, you know, sort of uh, the kind of per capita income that China had, and then the next uh, couple of decades, et cetera, there was a very significant increase. So it's not only in terms of the overall size of the economy, but also in terms of per capita gains, et cetera, which, is, which has been outstanding. So as a model of what is state capitalism, China's success indeed has been far more stupendous than any other country during the last five to seven decades. There's just no question about that, right? And that is where you know, China's sort of strategic choices are both sort of opportunities and challenges as China evolves. You know, uh, since we talked about 10 different crises, uh, Kinchi again, I mean, emphasize some of those crises at the current juncture, etc. But this is exactly what happens when there is an attempt to allow greater oversight and greater watch to the logic of capital, to use uh, Kinchi's phrase. Now, this is something which has been playing out almost as a, you know, Shakespearean massive sort of. Uh, you know, the story, uh, the way you try and sort of address something, then you have to contain something, etc. And that, that, that is something which is to be expected. You know, the, the fact of the matter is that once you 
opt for a certain kind of broad model. And again, I mean, I think Kinchi is, in my understanding, again, bang on target when she says that we are talking of one global system, but very significant differences. So it's not the case which pertained and obtained prior to collapse of Soviet Union and the you know earlier period of two different kinds of models with all their strengths and weaknesses, etc. We are talking of a model of state capitalism in China's case, but one which has been very effective, one which has uh, resulted in very significant gains, you know, as uh, Kinchi pointed out, in terms of the worst kinds of uh, difficulties. China has certainly succeeded, for instance, uh, chronic poverty of very difficult kind, uh, uh, very basic uh, needs, etc., fulfillment of those and so on. On all those, I mean, it's been a remarkable story. It's a remarkable story which uh, has, uh, of course, uh, been achieved over a reasonably short period. But then, what were the underlying strategies in terms of other kinds of consequences that uh, resulted? For instance, rural urban inequalities, uh, various other kinds of inequalities that uh, Kimchi was talking about, and uh, the kind of stress that uh, we have on particular segments, particular sections, etc. All that is part of that organic whole. You know, one couldn't have happened without the other in that sense. Right? So once you opt for a certain kind of development strategy of export-led and so on and so forth, you know, that needed to have what incidentally has been, as uh, Sitsui kept pointing out, the base of social stability in that country. It is exactly that base which was also used you know, through migration for this very, very powerful strategy of export-led development, right? how that sort of uh, plays out and so on. But in the process, you see, some of these things, the question, and this is what uh, maybe both of you can reflect on, how long can China, for instance, uh, be in this kind of global system and insist on greater autonomy? Would that be feasible? Right? So, the challenge of financialization that uh, uh, you know was 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 raised and mentioned you know, after the change from first April and so on is it something which is inevitable? Right? Sure. You know the fact that, as was pointed out, that of the top five banks in the world, China has four of these, and these are controlled by the society through the state. Right now, unless the society really turns against the state. No, which seems highly unlikely at this stage, right? you know, that kind of model is likely to continue. Okay, if that happens, we can certainly hope for a model of financialization, which would be very different from what we have seen elsewhere. In almost every country it is considered to be developed has more or less succumbed to the power of finance. You know, finance creates massive prices, uh, what does the society do? It basically bails out finance, you know, whether it's US, whether it's continental Europe, whether it's UK, look at any of these countries. It bails out uh, finance with the help of people's resources and people's money and people's, uh, you know, at times even their livelihoods and so on. Okay? Now, China possibly can go a different way. Now, these are some of the things on which uh, it would be good. Uh, if you wish to reflect a little more, uh, uh, both, uh, both of my great comrades, right? Uh, the fact that uh, we are talking of indeed uh, a very vast and diverse reality, it's a, it's, it's a very complex uh, sort of uh, situation where China's development cha you know, challenges are not made or unmade entirely in China. How does that then connect with the larger story? What could be some of the possibilities if you could tease out? Some of those possibilities from uh, from from that, uh, I guess uh, all that uh, would certainly help uh, uh, in terms of um, uh, sort of uh, clarifying a number of issues. The kind of challenges we have, for instance, for uh, those who, in many ways, are like footloose labor. Right? Would you like to say a little more on that? Basically, we are talking of. Uh, you know, the numbers vary because a lot of statistics which come to us, uh, that is to many researchers interested in China, outside China, uh, are uh, difficult to verify. For instance, uh, 
the total number of, uh, let's say, migrant uh, workers, rural migrants who come to work uh, in a whole lot of urban centers, uh, the numbers that I have seen have varied from some 200 million to almost 400 million, right? Uh, how do we make sense of that? What are the kind of challenges that you're talking about there and so on and so forth? Now, uh, last point, I can see that Comrade Josh is uh, uh, sort of... Uh, uh, getting a bit glaring <laughs> vis a vis me. So let me, you know, what, apart from this overall state capitalist model and so on, the last point which I want to make is um, this uh, a kind of tremendous commitment to the rural, to the peasantry, right, in the economics and politics of China. Because many other countries, the rural was completely sort of thrown aside from the imagination, right? Uh, they were completely sort of in a, in a they, they were squeezed and used in ways uh, which um, sort of uh, have been completely and utterly disastrous. Now, China also at certain points in time, you know, makes use of that rural rent, yeah? I mean, uh, sort of uh, rising inequality and so on, their contribution, etc., is well known. But the fact of the matter is that the kind of relative commitment which, which China has shown to the rural, both in terms of its economics and politics, sometimes has been pushed to that, forced to that, the leadership, uh, the political masters, the party and so on. And sometimes they realize that, you know, there's no other way. You know, if you, if you, if you want to, I mean, not only for the reason of political stability, but from the point of view of sustaining the economic momentum. Right? Now, it is these very powerful home truths which emerge from the Chinese, you know, Chinese story of economic transformation, to my mind, are very, very profound. You know, some numbers were given by uh, Sitsui, and let me not uh, repeat any of those. But uh, the last uh, decade or so, uh, uh, last 15 years or so, huge investments uh, in uh, rural areas uh, try to balance the rural and urban some of these things again are unprecedented anywhere and certainly you no know, whichever model of state capitalism you're talking about in that it's simply absent right now what do you see as the future of this going forward both of you right i mean i think that 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 is uh, uh, something which is very critical so on a couple of questions couple of issues if uh, both sitsui and kinchi if you could um, elaborate a little more, uh, how is in the current sort of development challenges framework, China is looking at its, uh, you know, footloose labor, right? What kind of prospects, possibilities, etc. Yeah, uh, some of those, uh, how does it look at uh, sort of, I have seen some of the numbers as regards the investments which are being made, but in terms of what is playing out in policy imagination, uh, and some of the other uh, sort of uh, areas or policies outside the rural, how would they impact on the rural itself? So I think some of these will be helpful for uh, many of our uh, uh, audiences, many, many of the members in the audience and so on. And indeed, let me uh, to end, uh, you know, I am completely convinced that there is no other meaningful model than what Samir used to talk about in terms of meaningful delinking. Till that happens, and that is something which was basically an insistence on including the majority, the what what uh, 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 Kinchi described as the logic of solidarity for the larger working people, etc. Without that, I mean, I don't see any way forward. Can that be strengthened? Thank you very much again for your wonderful inputs. And it's been lovely to hear both of you. Uh, thanks again. I stop. Okay. Thank you, Praveen. Thank you, Praveen. I hope uh, both Kin and Sid, you took note of the number of issues that were raised by uh, Praveen. Before you respond, I'd like to invite just one other panelist on board. Um, Zay Isa Shivji has just come on board. Uh, Isa, could I please uh, ask you to uh, make your contribution, but please make it, kiss it, nice and short. <laughs> Thank you. 
Well, well, thank you. Thank you very much for giving me this opportunity. And let me also thank uh, 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 Sid Sui and Kinchi for their excellent presentation. There is many issues. And uh, I also like a very hopeful note on which Pravin, Pravin ends. But I would like to raise sort of pointedly a number of issues. Up to now, my understanding of China was that one of the ways it managed to get to overcome crisis and not get entangled in the globalized financial system was by keeping control on capital accounts, keeping control on its capital account. But now Professor Sidsui tells us that in fact, China is increasingly adopting trend of privatization of its, uh, its, its, its banks and also opening up its capital account and opening up and getting integrated in the global financial sector. Now that I found find a bit a bit a bit worrying because it has enormous implications for the rest of the society. So I would like both of you to reflect on that. On the other hand, and this again I think is, is the great strength of China, which Pavin also pointed out, was that China has not given up the way its rural production is organized, the way its villages are organized. The first important factor in my view, central factor has been that so far, land in China is not, not commoditized. And I think this is very crucial for any development of capitalism, the commoditization of land. And this is where my, my, my worry also comes in. Once you get entangled in many financial, globalized finance, how long will China be able to hold out on, 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 on land which is, a, a, a not commodity, which is not commoditized? How long will it be able to hold on to that? Because that seems to me to be a central and a base for any hope for a different trajectory of development. Secondly, I also noted from your presentations that 60% of the people are still in villages and rural areas and there still is different types of collective, collective uh, 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 production and collective organization. Now that gives one's, one's, one's hope. Uh, and also I think something that I noted is very interesting is that the ownership, the banks are owned by the state, but the ownership of land is actually bifurcated. Urban lands are owned by the state but rural lands are not owned by the state. Rural lands are owned by village communities. That's, that's the message I got. And that again, to me, is extremely, extremely important. As a matter of fact, 1991, when I chaired the Land Commission in Tanzania, it's exactly without knowing that this was a case in China, without knowing that that's exactly what we, what we recommended. So that you do not have a monopoly of land ownership by land. Instead, land in the rural areas owned by village village committees. Now, having said that, my argument would be for the future now, in terms of the trends, what would be the politics of strengthening certain strengths of China, particularly small peasant production in the, in the countryside? What will be uh, the politics of it? How, for example, the class struggles are going to work out in, in, in China? While it is true as provinces, of course, we are not talking about society turning against the state, but of course, on the terrain of the state, on the terrain of society, the struggles going on. And so far, it seems to me that uh, the rural working people have managed to keep the gains of the revolution, okay? the keep the gains of land reform that was carried out during, during Mao's time. How do you see this working out, working out in, in, the, in the future? I th yeah, let me stop there, and maybe okay. we'll hear more from uh, okay. two professors. Those. Thank you, Those Comrade Shivji. And without much ado, uh, can I ask Max just to also keep it nice and short, please, Ajay? Yes, thank you. Um, I had a, a few questions about China's uh, international development strategy and the Arab region, which I would hope the, the speakers would be able to 
expand upon uh, how they see China's development strategy expanding in the Arab region, because it's very, uh, the, the developmental problematic, I think, is in some ways um, distinct from what um, the remainder of uh, Africa is confronting in that the Arab countries are actually confronting de-development, whereas in many ways the African continent is confronting underdevelopment. And so there's a fundamental sovereignty question that uh, the countries are confronting um, alongside confronting this issue of uh, reconstruction, for example, and the politicization of reconstruction in Syria and now Lebanon, unfortunately. And I was wondering if they uh, had any insight into the current uh, status of debates, both within their own circles or within higher level circles about what people are thinking, um, how people are considering the question of what the, what the US agenda is right now in countries like uh, Syria and Lebanon, where reconstruction is held hostage to dropping any sort of um, anti-systemic foreign policy agenda and what their thoughts are on, on this question. Okay, thank you, Max. So I uh, would like to give this opportunity to both Kin and uh, Sid to just uh, respond to some of the issues that have been raised by our panelists. Thank you. Maybe uh, Sitre, you could answer any questions you like and I, and I take up the rest. Okay. Um, um, actually, I feel very um, good at because um, I um, have many, um, I mean, uh, friends from uh, in India and Af Africa and also Latin America. So um, I actually feel very happy to um, to make friends with um, pe uh, with peoples uh, from uh, three continents and also to to share our concerns and to work together. This is, uh, um, I, I also want to uh, emphasize that uh, because um, even though I um, was born in, in China and grew up in, in China, but uh, my parents actually oversee uh, Indonesia. So um, because of this kind of uh, migration uh, family, I also feel have some ties with uh, different kinds of uh, developing countries and people. And uh, that means um, I, uh, I think the, uh, from, a I think from Asians uh, tradition, we have a long, long history of the uh, peasantry because uh, China has to know that we have uh, 4,000 or 5,000. That means uh, uh, even we, we talk about the uh, history of capitalism, it's only uh, several hundred. But when compared with um, the um, history of the, um, I mean the long, long history of the ancient history, that means uh, we, we actually, our the roots, I mean the, the roots actually based in the uh, rural commu communities. That is the, the what uh, I want to emphasize, the, the one point, you have a long history perspective, historical perspective, even though the uh, communist, so-called communist party actually also based on the peasant revolution and also practice the, uh, the policy of the land redistribution and also tax, tax uh, sensation. This is similar to the ancient um, and, and, and dynasties. So I think this is the rhythm, the historical rhythm we can't forget. And also, even we, we uh, Kinchi and I, also Professor Wen, and also our colleagues involved in rural reconstruction movement. And because of, uh, for the uh, 150, 150 years, because of the modernization, uh, you can also name it uh, uh, capitalist modernization. Because of that, we have the rural, the consequence of rural uh, destruction. And that means we named the movement as a rural uh, reconstruction because uh, Wuro was destroyed by the uh, capitalist uh, modernization. So this is, that means uh, that movement also uh, in tension with the, um, the state or uh, with the uh, party or uh, with that kind of the uh, policy of modernization. So that means uh, uh, we are not so very clear cut. That means uh, whenever this uh, modernization is still predominant, that means that movement is still exists. It's always in tension with this kind of the um, uh, the path of uh, modernization. I would say I would name it uh, you know, whether it's socialist modernization or capitalist modernization, and that that's why we have to uh, 
get involved in this uh, movement because uh, the community, rural community, always attack or always under pressure. Uh, you can name it privatization or capitalization or financialization. So uh, this is a long, long, um, I wish the uh, long way of struggling. And 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 uh, when um, you you, you uh, um, Pavin also mentioned about the problem of migration. Yes, uh, we have the so-called the uh, migrants uh, or uh, peasant workers. Um, uh, legally speaking, or uh, um, we, we don't have so-called um, uh, um, uh, proletariat because uh, uh, they are still have um, the homeland in the countryside, so they are named. Uh, peasant workers, not completely uh, proletariat, only a uh, neighbor power uh, on sale or so on the market. They have the, they still have land or uh, they have the um, rural tight with the, with, the, um, with the land. So they are peasant workers. So they are property uh, relation is in the countryside, not in the city. Yeah, and also um, that means uh, we have the so-called floating uh, population floating. That means uh, whenever they have crisis or they can't uh, stay in the city, they can go back to the uh, their home village, their country, uh, the countryside. So this kind of floating uh, migration, they always uh, give some hope because uh, uh, that means uh, we can still change our policy towards ecological uh, civilization. This is a, a governmental policy. But on the, on the same time, we, uh, from a social movement, we also think that this is uh, uh, very important to change it. That means uh, we can still have opportunities or space to change or to shift, to uh, delinking from the, uh, as I mentioned, the uh, financial globalization. And at the same time, we link to the state, uh, we link to the, um, the land, and also we link to the um, uh, different, I mean, peasant movement in different uh, countries, in different countries. And so when we talk about uh, state capitalism, we have to say, we have to emphasize that how can we put the state under people control? Uh, the state always in tension with the people's demand. For example, uh, 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 during the uh, fighting the COVID-19, and then uh, you find that the state already have to respond to the people's demand of you have to pay, I mean, to pay the, um, the medical costs for all the uh, co uh, co uh, confirmed case or the patients. You have to spend a lot of money for the um, healthcare the, uh, system. So uh, even, I mean, the, uh, for the last uh, uh, over one decade, uh, China also have this kind of uh, uh, privatization pressure, but uh, you find that the people's demand, if it's getting uh, force, getting powerful, you can let the stay under the people control. So this is not, um, I mean the, I, I mean that is always um, in um, intentions and also you find that the boundary is not so uh, uh, stable. You can uh, fight it to ask for more. So uh, that means uh, we think we still think that uh, we have to work from the below and let the above the listen to the people. That means why we still believe in people's power. Yeah. And um, thank. You. Okay, uh, I'll take a little time because I would like I see many. Um, friends and colleagues being here in this, um, in the, on this occasion, and I think it would be good to have more uh, dialogues and interactions. The first thing is, um, well, I am Chinese, but I don't think I can speak for the Chinese government or for the Chinese capitalists. And I think it's the same with all of us. So the question is, uh, uh, well, we can be critical, we can be assessing uh, the different policies, but I think um, uh, it, we have to also go beyond the kind of um, uh, explaining, F, the kind of um, position to explain F everything as the will of the state. Because the state, of course, uh, has this policy. But then if we, for example, look at China, that is why I emphasized at the very beginning 
that we have to look at the complexities, the diversities, because of the different lo uh, local specificities. So they may differ from province to province, they, especially within a province, then there will be so many differences uh, depending on whether it is um, uh, in the urban areas or the rural areas or the semi-urban rural areas. So I think um, so uh, for a lot of the um, policies of the state or for some of the work or some of the um, aggressions or some of the kind of um, investment policies of some of the, the corporations. Uh, I don't think I can speak for them. Um, I, I would be as critical about um, uh, some of these um, uh, policies. Uh, but I think um, the question is uh, on the question of uh, state capitalism. Um, I think uh, sometimes this term can help explain things, but sometimes they also blur a lot of um, uh, 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 substances. So for example, um, in China, I think um, we have to look at uh, the, this whole development. And uh, if we look at, for example, if we take the position of a peasant uh, in China. So, um, well, I think before the 1950s, uh, then, you, you see that the basically the villages are ruled uh, uh, well have some kind of a local uh, governance uh, that depends on whether it would be a benevolent elite the benevolent elite uh, the or the um, well, roguish uh, uh, tycoons uh, mafia people so uh, in Chinese uh, we have a saying that the the, the powers of the emperor wouldn't reach beyond the county level, which means uh, uh, below the county levels, there would be also a lot of these, these um, local uh, uh, well, uh, governance. But of course, uh, uh, and so if you look at uh, movies, uh, for example, um, in the movie, uh, Let the Bullets Fly. I don't know whether you watch uh, some of the Chinese movies. Um, so they talked about um, how in one particular place in China, then the um, official bought his, um, uh, 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 official, uh, well, one official bought his place, but then went there and then met up with the, the bandits, etc. So we have all these sorts, of, but then in China, I think one um, important development is that from the mid 50s on, there was an attempt for the state to have um, uh, control over all the surplus um, produced by the, uh, the, the working uh, peoples. And that is also why uh, we had the people's communes and the, um, and the uh, uh, encouragement of all women to go to work, but then at the same time, allowing women to have this sense of equality and having it uh, legally guaranteed, et cetera. So what, what I'm saying is um, we have to look at the, there are a lot of traditions in the local places and um, there would be the um, uh, when there is a, 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 a the, the state from the central government or from the provinces or from the counties, then there would be different ways in which these forces play out in the locality. So when we are uh, when we talk about a uh, rural reconstruction, uh, our approach is to go to the communities. But then we also try to see the, the problems encountered by the communities as not only uh, self-contained because they would be affected maybe by the crash in the, in the, in the Wall Street uh, uh, stock market. In some ways, they affect them. Maybe the QE in uh, US, then they affect how the local prices of the soya beans or of certain uh, uh, food items may be increasing. So uh, uh, our approach is to situate ourselves in the locality, uh, but then try to see how this locality is affected by different forces, which could come from, uh, from the, the other end of the world with the butterfly uh, effect, or they could be the kind of uh, relationships, social relationships, power relationships that are being played out in the, in the community. 
So that is uh, why uh, in the last 20 years in the rural reconstruction movement, which were um, movements, because there are many different people working on that. Uh, so we, uh, uh, we were working uh, both in rural communities, in urban communities with the agricultural migrant workers, uh, with the children of these um, workers, to try to see in what ways they have been affected adversely by certain uh, forces. And maybe in the last uh, 30, 40 years, uh, it's more, sometimes it's more the market forces uh, that have played a bigger part in their lives than state policies. So uh, that is why I emphasize the question of complexity, which is not unique to China. I think it is similar in every place in the world. But then for us, um, since we work as a kind of a rural reconstruction movement, so we, uh, that is also why we share so much with uh, Samia uh, Min, the ways we see the uh, uh, land being uh, the, the main gains of the peasantry, in the 1949 revolution. And that revolution was fought not just by the Communist Party and its armies, but also by the massive numbers of workers and peasants and students and youths. So uh, this one point I would like to emphasize, uh, but I think uh, Joshia would like me to uh, stop here. So I'll leave the other questions uh, maybe till later. <laughs> If we could just attend to that, uh, something has come through to say, uh, the presentations have been very nice, so we are grateful for that. So the question, it links up with our international solidarity. It says, how do the speakers see Chinese land grab policy in the global South? How is it going to work in favor of working class solidarity? And as a rider to that one, it says, what is the, the Chinese fishing in West African seas? So that is linked up on uh, solidarity. And then the next question I raised myself was, we spoke about de-linking. And uh, one says in the discussion that is going on in China, was there no contingency plan to this kind of uh, uh, forced de-linking given the fickleness of the US current admin's policy stances. And then the third question is, uh, what is the strategy of China towards India in view of ongoing standoff or the border conflict? Yeah, uh, okay. the view so also okay, just points out that India views China as the biggest enemy, not the USA. I don't know whether you'd like to comment on those three, please. Okay. So the first question is, I would defend the right of the peasants to land, whether that is in Africa or in China or in India. And I think that is the principle of the rural reconstruction movement, that the, the small peasants would have their access to land and to all the means of production and to achieve food sovereignty. And so I, uh, we have written about that in uh, many books and articles. Uh, so, uh, so that's the response to the first question about um, uh, China-India uh, rivalry or China-Philippines rivalry, and, I, and we we see that um, there were, there are all these um, um, well uh, rivalries and and also uh, this question about um, extending expanding your your um, the territories, and I feel that um, uh, among the feminist uh, peace mo movements then we will say that, um, well, we are against uh, aggressions, against the wars. And um, so, uh, and, and, but then I think uh, in these, then we have to have these uh, peace movement movements within our own countries. Because I feel that uh, the danger uh, sometimes is not about the territory, it's about this national patriotism which is being um, uh, 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 whipped up uh, in times of crisis for the benefit of the elite rulers. 
and it is the same, I think, in many different countries. So uh, it, uh, to counter that, then I think uh, that is uh, why we need uh, the more the solidarity among the, diff the peoples. And that is also why we have been working, we hope to be also working more uh, on some solidarities between uh, Asia, Africa, and Latin America. And, and there's also a lot we can learn from the indigenous peoples and so from the Zapatistas, for example, we see that um, there is, they emphasize that they are not going for a separate, being, to be a separate country, they are, they are Mexicans, they are patriots, but they also want the, their local governance, their, their mastery over their own lives. And I think this is the principle that all of us should stand on, that we want ourselves and in our communities, our communities as a, uh, as a collective, not just uh, atomized individuals, to be in control of the resources for life. Uh, and which means very importantly, uh, land and water and access to uh, clean water, etc. About the question of um, of, uh, of the, the companies uh, from China um, uh, going to uh, for the um, uh, uh, fisheries, etc., I think it's the same things that we learn also from the solidarity of our friends from Asia. For example, our friend we have many friends in um, Japan. Uh, Muto Ichio and uh, many of our Ohashi Masaki, they have been working with our friends here uh, from Nepal, from uh, Philippines, to, to counter the kind of um, uh, profit-seeking uh, ventures of their own governments or of their own uh, uh, corporations. And I think uh, uh, in that, then I think we, we also try to hope to learn from them. And I think um, it is a, a war on many different fronts. But then I feel that um, we, uh, how do, uh, the question is, how do we anchor ourselves? So I think we need to anchor ourselves in the local communities and always bear in mind that we take their perspectives, we take their interests, and we try to fight more for the common. The common has been uh, very much um, attacked and also um, uh, uh, fragmented. And it's the same scene in China in different places. But then in China, we also see that there is now, for example, uh, a, a, a movement that we are also part uh, of pro being promoting, that is for the young people to return to the land, to return to the villages, to learn how to grow food, etc. So even for my students in Hong Kong, they need to learn um, uh, farming, etc. And uh, Yan Xiaohui here, he's the instructor. He's a 15-year uh, uh, experienced um, expert in farming. Uh, so I feel that um, on the one hand, we have to look at the, the very um, uh, uh, dangerous kind of um, national, nationalism, the narrow nationalism that many of us are held hostage. Uh, but at the same time, then where we can break those, then I think if we all stand on the, uh, with the community, local communities for the welfare and then look for the solidarity, I think that is the way forward. And then I think that's also uh, what um, various um, alliances, including the People's Plan for the 21st century in Asia since 1989, and also the World Social Forums since the 20, uh, two, since the 2000s, and a lot of these, um, uh, the Via Campesina, the MST, I think this is all uh, also the efforts of all our friends and comrades that I think we need to learn from. Thank you. Uh, have you got any 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 additions to that, uh, Professor Sid? Yeah, um, I, I just want to emphasize that um, we also link up with the um, other social movement, also also peasant movement in um, Brazil, like MST, and also in India, like uh, Kerala People Science Movement. So uh, we, I think so, uh, we believe in people's uh, power from below, and also we start from this kind of uh, solidarity from below. So this is the our base. If we talk about the, uh, I mean, the alliance with the uh, Asia, 
Latin America and Africa. That means we start from people and start from people action and also start from people solidarity. So uh, this is our base. Thank you. Thank you. There's uh, two questions that have just come on board. One says, how is the division of work within the family changed with the rural reconstruction programs over the year? Are women less burdened with unpaid responsibilities of social reproduction than in advanced and developing countries? Has the gap between men in time spent on unpaid work decreased? That's one question. Uh, the next question says, what are some of the important uh, intellectual trends in China, apart from rural revitalization movement? Please. Were they clear? Okay, yes. Okay, so, okay. The, the first question is, um, well, I think since the, um, I think we have to look at the, um, the, the more macro situation, uh, as I said earlier, then uh, the, 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 um, the act for uh, gender equality was one of the first acts to be adopted uh, with New China uh, after 1949. And uh, in reality, you still have a lot of uh, inequalities. I don't think um, inequalities in family or in society can be erased by uh, implementing, uh, by promote, by promulgating uh, an act or a law. But then um, the, I think what was important was that when women were also part of the working forces, although they usually they get 70% of the pay of the men during from uh, up to, well, the, during the 1950s and 60s, even in the People's Commune, they got uh, well, only a, a certain uh, proportion of the, the men's rate. Still, I think um, in, in some ways, uh, especially in the cities, then there is a very strong sense of, um, be, of for equality. And I think that, and so I, what I'm, uh, I would um, not just look at it, not only in terms of the material remuneration, etc., but also in in terms of the sense of dignity, the sense of pride, the the insistence that we should be equal, although in reality it's not so. After 1979, with the open door policy, the reform policies. Then we also see uh, the situation of following the market laws. And so more if, if it is um, a question of uh, well, unemployment rising, of course, then we see women being the first to be asked to go home. So uh, in the 1990s, uh, I also uh, was part of uh, editing this book by Arena, which is called The Resurgent Patriarchies. Uh, and so I think, um, uh, this is one question we need to deal with, but um, uh, the, but then uh, uh, it is it's difficult to to generalize on that. For example, there's a lot of critic uh, criticism about the one child policy, but then in families when the one child is a girl, <laughs> and especially in urban areas, then the girl may be as um well as as equal uh, as any other. Uh, or more than equal than any other family members. <laughs> and so uh, it really um, depends uh, on the uh, uh, specific um, uh, situations. Then um, the, so I don't know what, uh, whether uh, Situi has anything to add. Yes, sit, please. Intellectual trends. Um, uh, you, you mentioned the um, gender e equality. Um, mm -hmm. I think is um, is uh, I, I mean yeah. Of course, uh, the women uh, liberation actually uh, is uh, one element of the socialism, but uh, it's an everlasting uh, struggle. So, um, but uh, in our experience, we find that uh, um, it, particularly in the rural society, we find that the so-called the left behind, for example, the elderly. The um, the middle aged women and also the uh, children. Sometimes it becomes the uh, pillar of the uh, social movement because uh, they uh, will also work together 
and to uh, completely devote into building the uh, uh, community. So sometimes even find that they are so-called uh, the vulnerable, but uh, in certain uh, to certain extent, they will uh, to work together, and then they will, uh, for example, they will uh, initiate some uh, activity, cultural activities. For example, in some cases in the uh, Earth uh, China, for example in Puhan, those uh, middle-aged women they will organize dancing club. And then to, through this dancing, they will get, get gather to get together and to talk about the community uh, problem, for example, the gambling or the uh, other the uh, uh, pollution. Any, any, uh, anything they will start to, uh, to think about the communities, uh, how can they build for their home? And also, I think that means uh, even we find that uh, uh, women, so-called the, uh, I mean the, uh, they are so-called marginalized. But to a certain extent, they can also to um, <laughs> well, uh, gather together and to uh, enhance their. Um, that that means get involved in this uh, social movement and get empowerment. So I think uh, when we talk about uh, whether uh, this is in in inequality, uh, I think uh, we have to uh, develop another uh, angle, particularly in um, I mean the in the, at the grassroots level. How can we let this so-called the vulnerable or marginalized uh, to um, uh, recognize their strength? And um, this is one point. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, I, okay. Uh, sorry. Trends. Yes. So uh, just very quickly. Well, what can you expect about the mainstream intellectuals uh, who would see uh, being educated in the U.S. as their priority? So the question is uh, with all these, um, I think uh, China is sharing the same problems as anywhere in India, in, 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 in South Africa, where the kind of modern education is also part of the ways in which people internalize the values for modernization, for what they see as good life. And I think, uh, and so in China, when many, when in, in the educational system, you cannot be promoted uh, to be a professor unless you've uh, been invited uh, to, 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 be, to, to, to go overseas or unless you publish in Western journals, in English journals, etc. So that's the same trend, whether it's Taiwan, Hong Kong or mainland China. So in this ways, I think uh, uh, well, we were just now talking uh, in a lot of the chats, uh, who's the main enemy, whether it's China or the USA. But I think sometimes the main enemy, enemy is ourselves. The ways we harbor certain values, the kind of um, things we crave for. And so if we talk about consumerism and also all these um, questions about uh, environment, of course, the corporations, the multinationals, they have their responsibilities. But do we not all of us have some responsibilities? So I also feel that um, that is uh, why there's a lot we need to we have to learn from the indigenous communities that have been organized. The communities from with the Sabatistas, uh, the communities I think that we heard from Rajava. And so there are these communities under stress and yet with very minimal material resources, they have been able to build their dignity and base their dignity on their collective efforts and on reprioritizing re uh, what they think is, uh, uh, is, is most important in life. So I can tell you the mainstream intellectuals uh, in China, uh, the way they talk, although they may talk in Chinese, the, the way they talk would be the, anything the same, like those who have been educated in, uh, in New York, in London, and I, I think uh, we all understand uh, what's going on. Uh, and I, I think it's the same with Korea, with Japan, uh, with East. But then I think uh, one, maybe one um, uh, interesting outcome of the current China-US uh, war, uh, whether this is the media war or the, 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 the moves that the uh, US is taking, is that it has antagonized a lot of people in China so the very pro-US sentiments that you would see two years ago have now somehow turned, and so the tide has somehow turned. And so the question is whether we can uh, also try to channel that tide so that it doesn't become a narrow patriotism, a 
narrow nationalism, but then a kind of critique about the whole kind of modern, so-called modern Western values, the universal values that people have been so much uh, striving for, and that we could return to some, some of our rural roots. So uh, I think uh, there's one quotation that uh, Si Chui always likes to quote from, that is from uh, uh, Liang Shuming, uh, one of the uh, pioneers of the rural reconstruction movement a uh, hundred years ago. And uh, he's, he said that, well, you have your roots. Uh, so even if you see the branches or the leaves falling, it may not be the end of the tree. But then if your roots get rotten and the roots die, then the tree will die. And what is the root? That is our rural, uh, that is our tradition. That is our, uh, um, uh, the, 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 the way, the collectives of uh, on the ground. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kim. Thank you very much. At this juncture, can I just ask uh, Praveen to just give us a, a wrap up and then we'll give our presenters, uh, you know, one more round of, uh, you know, closing remarks. Praveen? Uh, yes, uh, but, uh, uh, you know, I think, uh, in terms of responding to various interventions, again, a lot of points have been clarified. And I think, uh, you know, to me, uh, this whole question of, of addressing the rural, the peasant, um, and, uh, you know, building that pyramid, social solidarity, et cetera. I mean, that really has been one of the most profound things about China. You know, if we look at the last uh, sort of 70 years, there have been different phases and so on. But it's a sui generis kind of model in its own right. You know, the way it kind of you know, shifts from one point to another point and so on. Uh, and uh, that also is a great lesson for almost any country in the South oh. we've lost Praveen uh, oh, okay. as well uh, technology is uh, messing us up Praveen's commentary is broken Okay, um, can I just move on to our presenters also, maybe just to give us their closing remarks, because we're not able to hear Praveen anymore. So, you first. Um, um. Yeah, I, I would like to echo, uh, I mean, um, uh, call for the uh, solidarity from the South, particularly the uh, international alliance between peasants and workers. And I identify with the 99% because uh, I'm an intellectual worker and try to be a peasant in the 21st century. Thank you. Thank you. Ken? Okay, uh, I, I'm quite proud to say that actually, uh, from 95 onwards, then actually, uh, Sichu and I, we had been doing farming. Uh, so even though we are in, the, in in Hong Kong, in such an urban area, and actually I, we have farming classes for students, and I also have different courses in the undergraduate studies and in postgraduate studies um, to talk about um, questions about uh, farming, food sovereignty, and politics of eating, politics of food. And, uh, but then I must uh, say that um, we are the minority. We are not the mainstream. So whether it is in Hong Kong, in our own university, or whether in society at large, we are the minority. Even for the rural reconstruction movement, then um, it has recently gained momentum. So for example, when Professor Wen, uh, one of the, the leaders of the movement in China, when he does a live streamed um, uh, uh, broadcast of his speech. Uh, uh, I think at one point he had uh, 550,000 people listening to him. 
at the same time <laughs> to, to, for the live streaming. And uh, now, even now, he he's on a lot of these kind of uh, short talk shows, and he's promoting the idea of uh, going back to the communities. It's not like in the 1960s when youths were reluctantly were forced to go to the countryside to alleviate the question of unemployment in the cities. Now there is now more people uh, willing and uh, feeling that it is actually more secure to be in the villages. Whether this is because of the pandemic or whether this is because of the uh, your direct hold on to food and food sovereignty. So uh, even now when he speaks, uh, so some uh, I think uh, last week he spoke and then uh, he had um, one, one, uh, one million, oh, uh, no, over two million people listening to him. So it is, uh, the tide is changing and we are, and, there, I, and I think the word that defines it is uncertainty. We have a lot of uncertainties before us. There's, uh, you talk, we, we talk about the specter of the crisis, but then in the Communist Manifesto, we talk about the specter of communism. So which specter now is uh, trying, uh, getting more dominant? Uh, how they could become real powers? How people uh, could be um, motivated and also uh, have the confidence um, to be striving for the better and i think uh and i think that is also where we also have to uh, challenge the whole conception about development because just now uh, i think somebody uh, mentioned the question about the development or, or under development but then uh, the most de so-called developed countries are the countries that are, have been if you look at the history of 500 years of plunder and exploitation then these are the, the so-called developed countries are the most barbaric countries uh, in terms of the pillage, in terms of these um, uh, genocides. So I think um, we have to be um, uh, reversing uh, and also challenging the whole conception about development, about well-being, and I think that's also where the ideas about being Vivi uh, or um, the questions of well-being, the questions of the rural have be are becoming more important. And I think it's also up to us uh, as an alliance uh, in our friendships, in our solidarities, then we try to see how we can help each other to confront the difficulties ahead of us. And because this is also the second anniversary of uh, Sam Yamin's death, then I would also like to pay tribute to him to, uh, so that um, we can continue with his legacies. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Praveen, you were cut short by technology. So I had to do it uh, back to front, ask the, the presenters to do their closing remarks. But uh, you've got a minute to, to, <laughs> to wrap up what you wanted to wrap up before. Please. Yes, all right. So, no, very quickly, what I was trying to say is that. You know, I think there's a very one very important lesson and possibly the single most important lesson from China's development economic transformation is to address the agrarian question, the land question, you know, and if we don't do that, countries in the south. Yeah. I mean, I think, you know, any prospects of making even piecemeal progress is something which will be seriously, seriously threatened. And the second thing is, you know, what one might get very worried about is in fact China's turn into a kind of narrow nationalism in the most recent period, which is very worrisome. And this is where, I mean, I think for a, a whole lot of potential partners on the ground in the global south, the story could be a bit troubling. With that, let me, let me close what I wanted to sort of just flag as a concern. Thank okay. you. Thank you again to both. Uh, Kinchi and Sitsui for their wonderful contributions. Thank and you. Uh, to you, Josh, for your wonderful moderation. Thank you. Okay, uh, ladies and gentlemen and comrades and all, it remains for us to thank uh, Kim Chon Lao and Professor Sitsu uh, and Pravin Chao for uh, the excellent uh, you know, presentations and discussions that we've had. And all the other panelists, they were, at one time we had about 60 participants and now 55 are still active. I'd like to thank you all for participating and uh, you know, whether you're listening silently, 
participating silently, it is also very uh, a positive thing. And we hope we share these ideas as we go along. Um, just before we all also would like to thank our sponsors, organizers, the, the Sam Moyo Institute of Agrarian Studies, the Agrarian South, the Jawal Nehru Universities, and the University of Ghana, and all, and the Action Aid, of course, that have put this program together. And uh, we pray that we'll be able to uh, give some more um, inputs as we go along. Um, maybe, I'm not quite sure, uh, Joseph, if I gave it over to you, you might give us an inkling about the next uh, webinar, please. Uh, may I request Professor Paris to share about that? Okay. Professor Paris? Yes. Hello. Hi, uh, Paris. Yes, our next, hello. So our next uh, session will be in two weeks on Wednesday, the 26th. At the same time, it will be a session uh, whose key speaker will be Dr. Walter Chambati, uh, Executive Director of the Sam Moyo Africa Institute uh, for Agrarian Studies. And we will also do a book launch of a recently published book uh, entitled uh, Rethinking the Social Sciences with Sam Moyo. So that is the great news. Uh, we launched it in Delhi in the beginning of the year. We, we were supposed to have various other launches throughout this year, but uh, things changed. So we will do a global launch right here. Oh, great. Thank you. Thank you. Um, are there any other announcements that uh, we would like to make right now? Paris? Walter? No? No, no Chair. There's nothing? nothing from Joseph, me. anything else would like to make an announcement? Uh, nothing apart from thanking you, uh, Chairman, sir, for your excellent moderation. Please continue. Thank you. OK. Good night, good afternoon, until we meet again. Au revoir. No change, no change, no change, no change. Buena noite.